Tom Osborne says he built better football teams by helping build better character. In our conversation, he shared his approach to improving the person and the player. We put in a theme of the week every week, and we'd have some quotes uh, from Vince Lombardi or former president or Mother Teresa or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, we talk about what it might mean to them, and and uh, and we talk about it every day that week. And so essentially they had sort of a character education course over the course of 12, 13 weeks of a season. A lot, of them, a lot of them have told me that, you know, I didn't really understand what you were talking about when I was 20, but uh, I, I understand now. In fact, some of the players I talked with say that very thing. I just spoke with two guys who both say Osborne's like a father figure. They're both successful leaders and credit coach with helping get them there. They played on different sides of the ball, different years, but credit the same coach for helping make them successful today. Pretty safe place. Um, try to keep it that way. Curtis Cotton is a 21-year veteran of the Papillion Police Department. Recruited as a linebacker, he quickly realized he was too small, and Osborne offered some advice. Uh, he suggested I either move to offensive running back or defensive back. And I said, oh, Coach, I'd rather play defense, you know, I like to hit. Cotton became a standout strong safety on the field and in the gym. He looks like he could play today. Cotton was selected lifter of the year then, and just recently he was named to the Husker Power 50-year team. He credits some of that work ethic to Coach. I just really appreciate everything that he's taught me, uh, even if he didn't know he taught me directly. And this is what he was taught. One is being, being prideful and, and believing in what you do, listening. He always he gives you an opportunity to explain what happened if it's something that he didn't approve of. The sense of unity, uh, the team, it matters most. Um, you can take that and translate that to family, to friends, to your career that you choose. Um, but honesty, I think, is is probably what I got most from him. Is you got you have to be honest about about the situation that you're in. Nebraska's always taken care of me, so I wanted to give back to him. Joel Makovica founded and runs Makovica Physical Therapy. He's opening his 17th location, has nearly 170 employees. He had 185 guys on the team, so now we have about 170 on our team, and so it mirrors it a little bit. Makovica was an All-American fullback in the 90s, has three national championship rings, and the record for most touchdowns by a Husker fullback. After playing in the NFL, Makovica opened his business and says he runs it like a team. I was an athlete and, and I lean on my athletic background and, and Coach Osborne was a guy that influenced that a lot for me. His examples of that, how Osborne leads by example. He showed such character and, and, and integrity, the way he led and just kind of his emotions was always very steady. You know, there's always a quote that I always tell people is anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. When the things are going wrong and there's a lot of chaos around you, you need that steady leader that, that drives the boat. Makovica says Osborne did that in 2007 when Steve Peterson was fired and the department was in disarray. Osborne stepped in and said he'd take the helm as interim athletic director. I think people took a breath and said, okay, we're, we're going to get this righted. And, and I think that calmed a lot of Nebraskans. Did me. Makovica learned a team, a business, is only as good as its players, its workers. That's what helped make Osborne so successful. He found the best people and made them better. That's what we've tried to do as an organization is I learned from that to recruit you know, the best professionals, and then to develop them and really care for them as an organization. Now, both Makovica and Cotton say there is a side of Osborne most people don't see. Coach Osborne's a funny guy. He has a great sense of humor. He's kind of got this sense of humor that, that you're kind of thinking about it, and you're like, that was funny. People use the term legend. Yeah. Does that fit? I think it does fit. I don't think he'd ever call himself that. That is Tom Osborne. He is a legend. Next, Tom Osborne's third act, from player to coach to congressman, and the fateful decision that almost had T.O. leading a different team. I, I thought about going someplace else and coaching. Nineteen ninety-seven. Tom Osborne and his Huskers win their third national championship in four years.
Not long after the celebration, Osborne decided it was time to step aside, ending an era in Nebraska football. In many ways, Osborne's retirement as Husker head coach was a new beginning from coach to congressman but not without some consideration of leading someone else's team. I guess when I got out of coaching, I, I thought about going someplace else and coaching. But I just couldn't see myself coaching and not coaching at Nebraska. And I thought I still had some energy and I still wanted to be of some use, some service. And and that service led him to Washington. In 2000, he swept Nebraska's third district, found himself on Capitol Hill. You served in Congress. Mm -hmm. How was that? Well, it's, um, you know, athletics, you hope, is a meritocracy based on what you get done and talent, whatever. And uh, uh, Congress was different. And the freshman congressman found Washington to be a tough fit at times. I found very quickly that it didn't make any difference how hard you worked or how smart you were or what you tried to do or what, uh, if your heart was in the right place. Uh, it was more um, political. Osborne felt there was too much emphasis on fundraising. After decades leading the team, he was stymied in his effort to lead committees. It really isn't necessarily a meritocracy. It's more um, what can you do for your party. And I'm sometimes concerned that the number one concern of many people in Congress is number one, get reelected. Then number two is to have your party in the majority. Because if you're not in the majority, you really don't control anything. And then number three, it might be your district, your constituency welfare of the nation. And I will say this, there are more people in Congress than people think who have the right order of priority. They will take a hit per personally for the welfare of the country, but unfortunately those people are somewhat few and far between. So after six years in Washington, Osborne decided to try another approach to public service, governor. To many, the office seemed like his for the taking. It wasn't. What surprised you about that race? Well, uh, I guess you'd hoped you'd win, but uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a certain power in incumbency. And uh, one of the difficult things was that I felt an obligation to, to serve. Uh, I was elected to Congress, and so I was back there every week during the campaign season. And the only campaigning I did was out here on the weekends. And um, so I wasn't able to do that uh, full time. Osborne won in the metro areas of Omaha and Lincoln, but he couldn't carry western Nebraska. Dave Heineman did better in the Sand Hills, the small towns, even in Hastings. I, I told people what I really believed. And some of the things I told them were not necessarily politically popular. I was advised to take a poll and find out what people wanted to hear and then tell them what they wanted to hear. And I didn't think that was right, so I didn't do that. Like marijuana. You're still interested and you're still involved in issues of the day. Recently, not too long ago, you uh, got involved in the marijuana debate. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because I, I, I don't want people to think that I know everything or think I know everything, but I knew something about marijuana. Because you see, uh, when that first began to hit the scene back in the 60s and 70s, we began to have some experience, not very much, but some with our players. Does it frustrate you then when you hear headlines about some of the current players maybe also still being involved with this? Yeah, and it bothers Scott too, you know, and, uh, and I think he's uh, taking appropriate steps now. And, uh, but it is, a, it is a concern. Do you think society in general is going the right way, not only with marijuana, but just in general? I mean, you're, you're, you study man. Well, well the, the reason I'm really uh, heavily involved in teammates is the, uh, the biggest concern that I have right now uh, concerning our culture is family structure because uh, over half of our kids are growing up 
presently without both biological parents. It doesn't mean that a single parent doesn't try hard, can't do a good job, but um, it's harder. Uh, kids in single parent families are more likely to experience poverty mm -hmm. and uh, grow up with uh, higher chances of dysfunction. And, uh, and so we, we can't legislate strong families, but we can provide a mentor for these kids. And uh, in many of their lives, it's very powerful. And that's why he still spends most of his time on teammates. The purpose of meaning really comes from serving. It's not from getting and receiving, but it's from serving and sometimes sacrificing and dedicating your life to uh, another person uh, or a cause that's more important than yourself. And so uh, that's one thing that we're hoping that a lot of these kids learn because somebody has invested them uh, somebody who has no reason to do this. I mean, you're not a parent, grandparent, and not a teacher, and but you invest in these kids, and pretty soon these kids begin to realize that, well, this person who doesn't have any obligation to do this comes and sees me every week and cares about me and uh, loves me. For information on becoming a mentor or supporting the cause, go to teammates.org. Next, the tribute to Tom Osborne you may have overlooked. T.O.'s place in the High School Sports Hall of Fame as KETV News Watch 7 Chronicle continues. Tom Osborne is a fierce competitor, always has been. And among his many honors, an entire exhibit dedicated to him in the Nebraska High School Sports Hall of Fame. It's near downtown Lincoln, across from Memorial Stadium, and Osborne is just one of hundreds of outstanding athletes there. Our goal is to honor the past and inspire the future. Coach Osborne was always trying to inspire people to reach beyond even what they did on the athletic fields. That's one reason why Tom Osborne was one of the first people inducted here into the Nebraska High School Sports Hall of Fame. His is among the more than 500 names in the Hall of Honor. But Osborne's presence is more than just his name. We're sitting in the Tom Osborne football exhibit. Chuck so Johnston is director of, of the hall, and he says Osborne deserves his own exhibit because of his role as an outstanding athlete, outstanding coach, and outstanding mentor. If you look at Coach Osborne and the legacy of people from in our state who went on to play at the University of Nebraska, whether it's as a scholarship recruit or as a high school walk-on, you look at the value to high school athletics and what he's meant to this state, I, I think it's unparalleled without question. The Nebraska Hall of Fame has been honoring so Nebraskans am, since 1994 across all spectrums you know, of high school athletics. Nebraska's long been called a football state, so football history obviously is a major player here. No matter where you go to high school, you're always going to remember Friday nights. They call this wall Friday Night Lights. Hundreds of photos from across the state. Boys Town, of course, the great Boys Town teams. Yeah. Wahoo, Wahoo Newman game up there. There's a Monarch Titans game. There's just so many different things. And there are displays of football royalty, like Eric Crouch's high school uniform from Millard North, donated by the school trainer. When he pulled it out, he said, you see this tape? And I said, yeah, it's old. And he said, Eric always liked to have his right arm tight so when he threw, it just felt better to him. And I, of course, laughed and said, yeah, that was like four times a game, even for Coach Petito. He wore four, I think, because that was how many passes he would throw in a game. <laughs> I, I think that was his limit. I think that was always his He was his a deal. runner. He was a he, runner. Oh, was he ever. There are multimedia displays, interactive exhibits, lots of photos from the present and the past. Now, football isn't the only game in town or in the hall. There's baseball, soccer swimming, tennis, gymnastics. If it was NSAA sanctioned, it's probably here, along with some amazing athletes. This is my favorite picture, helmet testing. Yeah, nice. See, you yeah. could have done that. I, I, yeah. Who says that they didn't? Peaches James was one of the best softball players to ever take the mound, both for the Papillion Monarchs and then for the Huskers. Her high school uniform's on display here, complete with a note of encouragement handwritten on the inside from her mom. Well, a lot of people won't believe this, but Peaches did not have much confidence when she was young. And so I wrote in there, nobody better, love mom. Mom was right. 
I mean, there's so many stories here, Rob. There are just so many stories. Stories of triumph and of tragedy, like that of Julie Geis, a Centennial High star, pioneer in women's softball, who after her playing days worked for a company with an office in New York City. The day of the 9-11 attack, she was visiting New York City because she wanted to see the Yankees play and was going to stop by the towers where her company was to do a little bit of business. She went in and she got killed in the attack. You never know what somebody might show up with. Mike and Rasmussen curates a lot of what comes in here, and some of it's pretty rare. This is probably the rarest thing that we have here. This is a nose guard. Uh, the patent on it shows 1897. It's pretty straightforward how it works. This would tie around their head and would go over your face like this. And it's these kinds of unique pieces of history that the hall wants and needs more of. We want more and more of the old time uniforms. Mm -hmm. Those are hard to find because back in the day, schools kept them forever and they might wear them for 20 years and then they were in such tatters, they just threw them out. In the Hall of Honor, you can read the history, but Johnston wants you to be able to watch it on video. But we just want video that kind of has some type of historical impact where people look at it and go, wow, look at those uniforms, or wow, oh yeah, I remember that game. And they hope to start doing interviews. The idea is to praise and preserve. We want to be able to remember those things because it is a part of the fabric of this state. So if you're cleaning out your parents' house and come across some old sports gear, or if you have some cool video, call the hall. Up next, Osborne, the Sooners, and Switzer. What Tom Osborne says the Huskers started doing all year long to be ready for Oklahoma. Well, I still try to go to work around 8.30 or so in the morning and come down and watch football practice. Not the whole practice, maybe an hour or so. Two days a week, quite often Monday and Wednesday. And Osborne will tell you he likes what he sees. Not play by play, but by the decisions his former quarterback now makes as Nebraska's head coach. As far as football is concerned, Scott is uh, pushing all the right buttons. And I, I, it's really no disrespect to some other coaches we've had here. But I think it, it's important that you understand culture. I'm joined now by KETV News Watch 7 Sports Director Andy Kendi. Andy? Rob, Tom Osborne helped Nebraska close the deal to bring Scott Frost back to Lincoln. And Frost has brought the ideals and approaches Osborne taught him. That includes attention to the walk-on program. Oh, a lot of those players will end up becoming really good players for you, but more than anything, they changed the culture of the program because those guys and we had about 50% of our squad were walk-ons. And those people, by definition, are overachievers. You know, they're people who are really dedicated. They usually have pretty good character, pretty good work ethic. And eventually, that work ethic and that character level begins to permeate your whole team. And so the walk-ons did something more than just inter inject some talent. They injected a, an, a, an attitude and an atmosphere that was very helpful. And so. Scott understands that better than many coaches have in the past. And, um, and I think he's somebody who's honest with people. I think he relates well to people. I think he uh, probably is somebody that most parents would want to have their son play for. Tom Osborne is an eager student when it comes to football. Others, though, say he's the teacher after showing off a style of offense that may have been before his time. You know, college football today is all about the spread offense having all sorts of options. So I asked Osborne, are coaches now taking what he did back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? We did an awful lot of either or. In other words, I gave the quarterback complete uh, option to change the play, either the direction of the play or go to a different play because I wanted to make sure that that quarterback thought just the way I did. So the, defense the way I did. That's coaching, right? Like the pendulum will switch, the defenses eventually will figure out a good way to at least attack or slow down the offenses, and it's mm -hmm. up to the coach to figure out a new way. Isn't that the way football has, has evolved over the years? So we saw that with Oklahoma. Oklahoma went to the wishbone. And uh, the only time we would see early on, the only time we saw the wishbone was Oklahoma. We have four days to get ready for it. And that was so different than every, what everybody else was playing. 
and it involves your secondary because you have to have somebody on the quarterback, somebody on the pitch, and uh, and so as a result, we had, we struggled. And then finally, we began to start practicing against the wishbone every week. We'd spend a period on Monday on the wishbone uh, through the whole season, and we hit Oklahoma. And toward the end, uh, we shut them down pretty good. Nebraska was heavily favored in so many of those games back in the 90s. Osborne said that they would actually focus in on in-game goals. In fact, Osborne said he could only remember one game the Huskers lost to an opponent with a losing record. That was back in 1992 at Iowa State. Certainly a remarkable record of consistency. Rob? Thanks, Andy. We also asked Osborne about the college football playoffs. Osborne thinks it may be time to expand the roster from four to eight. There are some really good teams that get left out. And with the playoff system the way it is now, you used to have those major bowls. And if you were in a major bowl and you played well, there was some chance you could be voted national champion. And so now those major bowls are no longer uh, a big deal, or not the big deal they once were. Because if you're not in the playoff and you're not part of the playoff system, you're really a second tier situation. And so you like to see more people have an opportunity. I know Scott very much would like to see it go to eight. Next, the takeaway Tom Osborne wants to leave with you. This is a KETV News Watch 7 Chronicle special. Well, first thing I don't want to do is I don't want to worry about my legacy. I saw that in, in politics. You know, so many people were concerned about their legacy that they get some bill passed that was a lousy bill, <laughs> but they had their name on it. <laughs> so I think uh, sometimes you start worrying about your legacy. It really gets in the way of what's important. He's a member of the College Football Hall of Fame, a recipient of the Jim Thorpe Lifetime Achievement Award, ESPN's Coach of the Decade in the 1990s, even though he retired after the 97 season. Tom Osborne, though, has had his critics through the down years and the championships, the tragedies and the triumphs. Through all of it, he's answered the questions and stood up for what he believes in. He tells me his faith guides him daily and hopes that sets an example. It isn't so much how much you get, but it's more, more about uh, what you can give and accomplish and how, how well you can serve that uh, is really in the final analysis probably going to be the most important thing. We hope you've enjoyed this hour with Tom Osborne. You can catch it anytime on KETV.com and the KETV mobile app. I'm Rob McCartney. Thank you for joining us.